Hi, I'm Laurie Power, Director of Lifelong Faith Formation at Christ the Redeemer Parish, and welcome to Talking Saints. I'm here today with my co-host, Pete Sanchez, reporter for the Catholic Star Herald, and we'll be spending just a few minutes talking about a particular saint and how his or her example can inspire us. Because as Pope Francis reminds us, to be saints is not a privilege for the few, but a vocation for everyone. Hey, Pete. Hey, Lori. How are you today? I'm good. It's good. been a hot summer so far, hasn't it? <laughs> it has been a hot summer, um, but I, I think these, um, I'm just trying to stay in air conditioning as much as I can. Exactly. It's cool in the vault where we're recording. Right? Yeah, it is. And I know you mentioned uh, a few minutes that we're going to talk about the saint, but there is a wealth of information that we have I know. on we this. We both love this saint now, so this could go a little long. Just be warned, everybody. Yeah, but I think it's it's emotional it's an emotional story. It's a story that has to be told, um, especially I think for the priesthood. And Lori, if if you'll um, if you'll indulge me, I'll um, can I let me see if I can pull it up now. I found something that this, uh, or I don't know, maybe I'll leave it for later because uh, at the saints oh, beatification, a teaser. you're teasing our listeners. I am, well, the, the 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 saints beatification. Yes, had a wonderful. Um, just the priest who was there mentioned uh, just something really lovely, and I, I think I'm you not going to share it. No, okay, no, you know what? I'll I'll say it now. Okay, because I it. found it. Um, well, let's tell everyone, of course. Blessed Stanley Rother. Yes, <laughs> That's who we are speaking okay. of. So technically, he is not canonized yet. He's blessed, but he's on the road there. Yes, he, he went from simple Oklahoma farm boy to just a blessed, and he's one step. He's, I guess, on the doorstep of St. Hope, can we so. say? And he's a martyr, so... He's a mar- you're first, the first <laughs> American-born martyr. Yes. Uh, that is something... He's not the first American martyr, because Isaac Jogues was in that class. Mm. But Stanley Rother was born in Oklahoma, so... But this is what uh, this is what Bishop uh, Coakley, I think I'm saying that right. Was mm-hmm. he Archbishop yes. or Archbishop Paul Coakley of Oklahoma City? He actually uh, they dedicated a shrine to him in Oklahoma City earlier this year, and this is what Archbishop Coakley said. And then we'll we'll explain why he said this. He said, at a time when the priesthood of Jesus Christ is so little understood or so little valued due in no small part, admittedly, to the sins of some of our brothers. We need heroic, faithful, generous witnesses to remind us of the dignity of our vocation. And he was talking specifically about Blessed Stanley to the young men in Oklahoma, but it's for everybody, Mm -hmm. you know, to pray for these young men, to pray for individuals to model Blessed Stanley. Absolutely. So we, we need heroic about, priests for sure. We do, and and so Lori, how about you start us off? We 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 started and we'll start in Oklahoma, obviously. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so he was born on March twenty seventh, nineteen thirty five. So very recently, I was just thinking he's around my parents' age. So <laughs> someone we could have known possibly. Yeah. Um, and he was the oldest in his family born to Franz and Gertrude Rother. He grew up on a farm. Um, He, as you said, basically farm boy. He worked hard doing his chores. He went to school. He went to Catholic school, Holy Trinity. Uh, Catholic Church was his parish and went to the Catholic school. Played sports. He was an altar server. You know, he did all the activities that you would do that someone in a small town, growing up in a small town, would do. Um, And apparently in high school, he started to discern the possibility of uh, vocation to the priesthood. But this was a big surprise to his family (laughs) because his grandfather was a farmer. His father was a farmer. They assumed he was just going to take up that particular role. And um, I think his dad had something funny to say that you were reading about um, when he told them that he was thinking about the priesthood and going into the seminary. But what was his dad's response to that? Well, keep in mind, this is a young man, Stanley. He was driving a tractor at the age of 10. That's right. And could fix anything. So <laughs> he, he had was, the skill set he, to be a farmer. He yeah. did. He just was a simple man, worked hard. His family did pray the rosary every day. And their faith was the center of the life. But still, when he told his parents he was going to enter the seminary, his father said, then why didn't you take Latin instead of spending all that time with the future farmers of America? (laughs) Sounds like a practical guy. But we will see that the skills that he learned will be helpful in the future. God, nothing goes to waste, I think, when we're serving the Lord. 
back so we can say that. That's what he could have said to his dad. Well, God yeah. will use it somehow, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then funny enough, I think on that same day or shortly after, his sister announced her intentions to join a vocation. That's uh, right. And the funny thing is they didn't even talk about it. <laughs> Uh, they they just they they didn't know they individually discerned without uh, so I wonder what this family felt you know they had no inclination their their uh, son and their daughter, and their daughter would yeah. but then so and when I point, was reading uh, part of one of his biographies they said it was a really hard time for the family because it's like they lost a daughter and a son within like the same same year within a couple months of one another um that's a huge change in their household and the younger siblings sort of took it kind of hard too so yeah but you could see that god had placed a call on both of their lives certainly uh, and you're talking about it's a hot summer here imagine oklahoma yeah. that's got to be really really warm well and probably prepared him for where he was eventually going to go as a missionary <laughs> exactly exactly so he entered he entered a seminary first in texas yes and, and you know what Maybe his father was a little prophetic there, Pete, because well, he said you should have studied Latin. And exactly. Sure enough. <laughs> no. <laughs> sadly, mm-hmm. he he failed his first year because he struggled with Latin. That was his his nemesis there. That was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh-huh. I, I heard someone talking about this, and they basically said to him, "You know, maybe Stanley, you should consider another vocation." Almost is what they were. Saying. Why don't you go home and maybe consider something else? And he felt strongly that God was calling him to be a priest. So. Yeah. Thanks be to God, his bishop was supportive and actually found another seminary for him, yeah. which is kind of a local connect. Well, sort of local, closer to us than Oklahoma. It is, um, he completed his studies at Mount St. Mary's. Yeah, one Edmonds of the, Bay. my favorite places to go. Yes. I try to go at least once every other year. I have family nearby there. So whenever yeah. I visit them, I'm like, can we just go to the shrine there? The, I'm surprised uh, they don't. Maybe they have something there, like where he studied or where he. We'll have to next time you go check it I out. Will, see if I they will, have any Blessed Stanley. Uh, I'll report back. Okay. Later. That's the, <laughs> that'll be a little uh, teaser for if I find anything. But yeah, he, he went to Mount St. Mary's, and then he. Uh, that is when he he was ordained a priest uh, on May 25th, 1963. So, 60 years ago this year, mm. um, and his ordination prayer card read, uh, and this is gonna you know this tells his whole life for my own sake i'm a christian for the sake of others i'm a priest Mm -hmm. and but it didn't sound like he stayed in oklahoma too long right laura no i think he was like an associate pastor at a couple different parishes for only five years so not long at all until he actually sought and received permission to uh join the staff on one of oklahoma's missions in guatemala yeah um i think it was uh, fairly new, I guess, for uh, Oklahoma, but established. Um, And it's something he, I guess, felt called to go down and serve the people there. And he actually served uh, a native tribe called Zutuyil, which were descendants of the Mayan people. So it was interesting. Although he had struggled with Latin when when he was in the seminary, he learned Spanish and he learned the local language that they spoke in that community. So that's amazing. I think maybe it was almost a grace because that was his call. He needed to be able to speak both those languages to serve the people. He even celebrated mass in their language and eventually helped translate the New Testament into that native language. It's amazing. So he was known known in Oklahoma as... Not quite the best and brightest, but very pious man. Mm. But it's interesting when he goes to Guatemala and gets the uh, the smell of the sheep, mm. so to speak. That's he true. Uh, there's that power, you know. God uses us in our different charisms and our different uh, our, our different skills, mm. and that was his skill where he he needed to he. I don't want to say street smart. You've heard that phrase, book smart and street smart. Right. Like he kind of, he was he had more practical skills. Exactly. Like, Thank yeah. you. I That's mean, he even, form. like, he put his farming skills to use. So God was exactly. using it by helping them in their fields and bringing in new crops, building an irrigation system. So he really helped us because I think when he went down there, he saw extreme poverty. Um, most of them living in one room huts, those who were in his parish. So he really used those farming skills to help them improve. Um, their farming and maybe have a better a little bit more income mm-hmm. i remember it was something very very minimal um when i was watching the documentary about him like they would make 50 dollars a year that would be the income for the people he was serving in that location wow. so incredible he did yeah uh, you know in addition he also built 
he built hospitals and radio stations. Oh, that's awesome. So the uh, part of that, just he knew he knew what he could do. And uh, unfortunately, during this time, too, Guatemala was under a civil war mm. that had really, um, it had lasted quite a while. And um, at this point, they were... Yeah, the church was kind of in the middle because yeah. they continued on teaching and educating the people and helping the people. So they were sort of viewed as uh, like not working with the military, yeah, you know, the, the government. government. So, uh, And I think even the, the government troops had camped on his parish farm. That's and right. He saw, uh, Stanley saw a lot of uh people killed mm. in front of or, him and, and kidnapped and just gone just as very, exactly like, yeah they, so he i remember he either wrote about it or someone else was talking about it that the, the the government said they were coming in to protect them and his hand shot up and said well i'm sorry if you're here to protect us why are my people disappearing you know they they, yeah. <laughs> they, they he was obviously questioning whether they were really there so and that might safe. have been what literally put him on a hit list mm, unfortunately the death list um, yeah death list where uh, it's it just that's a that's that's a rough thing to be a part of. So, you know, and he, so many he he knew. So um, they actually have letters that he wrote back to the bishop um, of Oklahoma City, and this was less than a year before he died. This is what he wrote about the situation, the climate in Guatemala. The reality is that we are in danger but we don't know when or what form the government will use to further repress the church. Given the situation, I'm not ready to leave here just yet. There's a chance that the government will back off. If I get a direct threat or I'm told to leave, then I will go. But if it is my destiny that I should give my life here, then so be it. I don't want to desert these people, and that is what will be said even after all these years. There is still a lot of good that that can be done under the circumstances. So he knew... His life was in danger, but he also knew that these were his people, and he was not going to abandon them. No, he wasn't. Inspiring. And there was a, uh, and then he, well, he did, he did go back for a he bit. Did. He returned for I about five when months. He, when he found out that he was on a death list, <laughs> yeah. Um, both he and another priest returned to Oklahoma. Maybe that was the bishop, or um, not sure who if he was called back or he chose to do that, but it seemed like almost as soon as he got back to Oklahoma city, he was, he wanted to be back with his people. <laughs> and there was something where he, he remembered um, a sister's community who had left and uh, they wanted to return. Um, but the people then asked, where were you when we needed you? Mm. And so I guess that was, that had been in the back of his mind. And uh, he went back to, Oklahoma and I, it was it wasn't interestingly that, he not back to Oklahoma sorry he, he back wasn't to Guatemala Oklahoma. yeah, yeah so Guatemala. he made it back in time for Easter so he actually returned on Palm Sunday so it was almost like wow he's a, definitely a Christ figure in this situation the fact that he was back with them for Holy Week and returned on Palm Sunday yeah there's I'm, I have a book here that explains some of it it's uh it's called Blessed Stanley Francis Rother, The First American Martyr. It's from a presentation from uh, Most Reverend Anthony B. Taylor, who actually knew him. Um, so he was a, uh, yeah, this is a fascinating book. Um, and it says here, yeah, he um, had gone to uh, Palm Sunday. Like you said, he celebrated that. And he celebrated the... July 25th, 1981, the Feast of St. James. Mm. And there was a patriarchal feast of the parish where he was at Santiago Atitlan. Of course, yeah. Because Santiago wow. is James so they in had Spanish. a big celebration. Yeah. yeah. So he um, had all that, and it it's just a joyful celebration. And then on the 25th, he had a wedding ceremony for about 100 couples and 260 children. And he, uh, he baptized many on the 26th. Wow. And so even... And then the 27th, he uh, he had supper with some of the Carmelite sisters and was already talking about stuff for the next day, was even going to donate blood. Oh, wow. And oh, that's wild. He donated blood in a different way. Yeah. And, uh, it was so, interesting. He even was thinking about um, what he would do. He had a plan. He said, if they come into the rectory, I'm not leaving. They're not yeah. taking me alive because he had known that others were taken and were tortured. And I don't think it was so much that he was afraid of being tortured. It was that he would reveal 
information that he wouldn't want to reveal, like where his parishioners lived or because they were always looking to find out who's leading the, you know, the Catholic community. Um, and he was just afraid that he would do that. So he knew if they came for him, he had told people, I'm not, they won't get me alive out of the rectory. So yeah. on July 28th, around um, 1 a.m., July 28th, 1981, uh, three men entered the rectory and they did find him in his room and he did fight back. Apparently there were defensive wounds on his hands and then they executed him. Um, and this shocked the people. And honest, interestingly, no one was ever held responsible for his death. So they did not catch those who murdered him. But the people were uh, just at a complete loss. And I think even by the next day, there were over a thousand people that had gathered in his parish when they heard that he had been shot. So um, yeah, he, he was a true shepherd to them and they were, you know, they were there to be with their spiritual father. He'd been there 13 years. Yeah. So he developed such a connection with them. And he was, um, he was a, a, a priest from Oklahoma, but he, he his his world was mm. Guatemala with this community with the Zutuil and uh, and just remarkable and there were there were a lot of funeral masses in Guatemala and thousands in attendance and then it was returned to Oklahoma in August and uh, there was one funeral for there and uh, you know he laid down his life for a sheep as one of the as the archbishop at the time in Oklahoma said mm. you know he um this pay, and this is what the Archbishop said. This past spring when Father Stan was home, I tried uh, to persuade him not to return. As a good shepherd, he replied simply, I really think the people need me there. Mm. And they did. And, uh, you know, his heart, yeah, his heart was um, in Santiago. And then um, it's still there. His heart is still there. That's and, right. And, yeah. Literally, they requested that his heart be enshrined there yeah. in Guatemala. So his body's here at his shrine in Oklahoma, correct? Yeah. But his heart is still in Guatemala with his people there. Yeah. And and there were there were a lot of fruits from yes. after you mentioned Lori. How many? So vocations? the parish um, actually had been founded in 1547, and for 400 years there were no vocations to the priesthood that came from that parish. Since 1981, when he died, there have now been nine priests from Blessed Stanley's Parish ordained, and there are seven more men in the seminary. So that's incredible. It is true. The blood of martyrs is the seed for Christians, as Tertullian reminds us. We can see yeah. that. Um, in, that's an incredible increase in vocations in one parish. So it must be his example and his uh, intercession. And the so. priest who, who followed him was there for 16 years. Oh, wow. I did not know yeah. that. Father cool. Tom McSherry, Oklahoma City. He uh, was there. And then, um, yeah. And, th and then this past year, so he was beatified by Pope Francis in 2017. 2017, yeah. 2017, September, declared. actually, in Oklahoma City. They had over 20,000 people from all over the world attending the event. It's incredible. That's right. Yeah, and the... Um, and he's also... So the first martyr from the United States and the first U.S. born priest to be beatified. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and it was actually only the second beatification ever to occur in the United States. Ooh, see? The first had been Blessed Miriam Teresa Demianovitz three years earlier. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, um, she was a sister of charity in, uh, in Newark, which I did not know. Uh-oh, we got to do our homework. North. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's that's another one. Um, so now... Um, so now they actually celebrate every year his, uh, they would be celebrating today, Pete. Yeah, this <laughs> in weekend. The, uh, yeah. In the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City and in Guatemala, they celebrate his feast day, which is awesome. I bet yeah. it's quite a party. And that is, and, and I think the... And um, his local home parish, his childhood parish, they celebrate his feast too. Yeah, this church, the shrine uh, was dedicated in Oklahoma City, uh in February, and that's he's in re, he's in a chapel at the shrine. Oh, that's, that's where great. his body is. Uh, Stanley I Lothar. say we take a road trip, Pete. Let's go. That would be wonderful. <laughs> no, I'm think, and uh, the mass was celebrated even in uh, in Spanish as well, oh, right. kind of to reflect that. And this is what this is what Archbishop Coakley said to the life of each and every saint in the history of the church manifests something of the perfection of Christ. And it reveals God's beauty, his truth, and his goodness. So, and he, um, 
his sister was there, Sister Marina yes. Rother yeah. was there, and um, it just, it, it's a packed congregation. And I think they even, the shrine is modeled after the chapel in Santiago Atitlan, oh, wow. where he was. So oh, that's beautiful. It just, they, it just did. Just to show how much, how much of that impact he had in that area, and it, it's it's quite a story. I mean, you, it's um, yeah. I don't. It's I, inspiring I, to have that. Um, it is. So one of the biographies that was written about him, which I would recommend, I did read a good part of it. It's called "The Shepherd Who Did Not Run," and that's actually based on a letter that he wrote when he knew he was in danger. He actually wrote back to people. It was, uh, I think Christmas the year before he died. And he said, a shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger. So he knew there was a risk, but he stayed because he wanted to be a good shepherd with the heart of the heart of Christ, the good shepherd and stay with his people. So I think it's very inspiring. Yeah. His life and his willingness to suffer and die for his people to stay with them. Well, no, no, you know, in, the, in in knowing, going into the fire, mm. so to speak, he uh, he went in there, and he got close to that community. He he, like you mentioned, he he helped translate the New Testament yeah. for them, and he knew the language, and he built these schools and these hospitals, and helped them out with electricity, and he just. You know, people could have said he was not the best and brightest. And, you academically, know, according, maybe. Yeah, yeah, academically, but in when 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 God needed him, mm. you know, and that's and that that's something. You know, we, we God always puts us where we need to be, and I think that is where I think that's a message for all of us. Where sometimes if we don't think, you know, um, what am I called to do here? What am I? You know, I'm not this i'm not that and we think we need to be somewhere else we need to only think about the gifts that god's given us and work where we are and Mm -hmm. ask god you know let me be your instrument and we never know i mean that's that's just i'm sure growing up in oklahoma he did not think he would ever be going to guatemala yeah i mean how many he would be a martyr yeah Yeah. (laughs) and it just it's such an interesting story that you know these saints lives and who we're called to be it's still a mystery for us we don't know where life is going to end up so we just keep the faith and we use our god-given gifts to the best of our ability um he experienced obviously a very strong call to be a priest even after failing the first time in seminary he still persevered so i think that tells us you know, when God is calling you to something, be faithful to that. You might not see the full extent of where that's going to lead, but when we're faithful, God gives us the grace. And I think martyrdom, there's a grace for that. People don't set out and say, oh, I'm going to be a martyr. No, No, I think in the, when it, when the time comes, God gives you the grace for that because that's what's required to carry out his will. So. Yeah. He, um, gosh, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful story, and he's a beautiful example for us. Even today, you know, maybe we're we're not going to be martyred, but we're certainly at times persecuted mm. for the faith. And it's another example of just keep pressing on and keep running the race and fighting the fight, as Saint Paul would say, uh, to for the glorious crown. Amen. So. Uh, do we have? Do we we did. We say, actually have his prayer for canonization. So, yes. if anyone is in need of a miracle, <laughs> Blessed Stanley probably needs another one to become Saint Stanley Rother. So, here's a prayer that you can pray asking for his intercession. O oh God, fount of all holiness, make us each walk worthily in our vocation. Through the intercession of your saints, on whom you bestowed a great variety of graces on earth. Having graced your church with the life of your priest and martyr, Blessed Stanley Rother, grant that by his intercession this humble flock may reach where the brave shepherd has gone. Grant that your church may proclaim him a saint, living in your presence and interceding for us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed Stanley Rother. Pray for us.